King Lear, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. <laughs> Gloucester must have been a vegan. <laughs> Rudyard Kipling wrote of young men dying in World War I. And if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. That legacy of lies continues today. Everything we think we know about the meat industry is a lie. See, the world is crying out for only two things, leadership and the truth. Today, I'm simply going to tell you the truth. The wise Chinese have a term for it, Zheng Tao. Listen to the friend who tells you the truth, even when it hurts. So let's just tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word Satyagraha means the truth force. Now, Brendan Camelli, in the book of Judas, wrote, if you want to serve your age, betray it. But what does that mean, to betray your age? It means expose its lies, humiliate its conceits, debunk its arrogance, expose its secrets, and condemn them to face harsher truths. As Albert Toffel said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I have long admired Count Moltke, the great Prussian general, a soldier who preferred to think rather than to speak, a man silent in seven languages. But you see, it takes courage to stand up and speak. It also takes courage to sit down and listen. Now, there was a time when my favorite food was filet mignon and lobster, a fact for which I am so profoundly ashamed today. So what made me, an investment banker, decide to leave the world of lobsters and learjets in exchange for shelters and slaughterhouses? to take nothing but pictures, own nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. You see, something happened to me. In the course of my work, I had been to Dante's Inferno, but unlike Dante Alighieri, I did not have Beatrice for my love, nor Virgil for my guide. I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before. In the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother whale as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to the calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. And I discovered that when we suffer, we suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. So when I look into your faces today, I recall the words of the Greek poet Horace. Change only the name, and my story is also about you. So this is where we work today. This is where we invest our money. In China, 7,000 magnificent moon bears their limbs torn off in traps, are imprisoned in steel coffins welded shut as a catheter drains bile into a bucket which the Chinese drink. For 26 years, the bears can't move, they go insane. In Korea, dogs are beaten to death in the marketplace because Korean butchers believe that pain and suffering makes the meat tasty. In South Africa, 5,000 tame orphan lions are drugged and then killed with guns, spears, or torn apart by hunting dogs, and they call it sport. In Canada, 300,000 baby seal pups are clubbed and skinned alive on the ice, their tiny hearts still beating. In Australia, we killed 90 million kangaroos who happened to adorn our coat of arms, the largest land animal slaughter on the planet. 
and we in Australia sent millions of our animals born on Australian soil on death ships to the Middle East where their eyes are stabbed out and their tendons are slashed for 30 pieces of silver. Believe me, every penny that I invested in the Basatine slaughterhouse to try and improve standards with the Muslim butchers was utterly wasted. I won't be making that mistake again. In Asia, dogs are suspended on steel hooks and skinned alive to make trim and fur coats sold in the West. And we treat the ocean as our private pantry and as a public toilet. The Pacific Gyro now is so full of plastic, junk, and human feces, it has created a floating footprint bigger than India. Dolphins and whales are stabbed to death in the shallows of Japan and Faroe Islands. Huge bays are blood red. Many of you probably know my involvement with sea shipping. 100 million sharks are torn from the sea, their fins hacked off and their bodies thrown overboard to die agonizing deaths for shark fin soup. So-called unviable dairy calves, who cannot be sold for veal, are killed by farmers smashing in their skulls or jumping on their rib cages and crushing their hearts by the millions. Billions of bouncy little chicks are ground up alive in mechanical mincers or suffocated simply because they are male. And more recently, our travels have taken us to see religious sacrifices where innocent animals make the 21st century look like the new dark ages. Whilst children in poor countries starve because their croplands now produce meat for foreigners. I won't show you any more pictures. Now, in human history, only 100 million human beings have ever lived. 100 billion. Today, 7 billion people are alive. And we torture and kill 2 billion sentient, living, loving animals every week. 2 billion. And we stab and suffocate 1 billion ocean animals every 3 hours. Trillions of fish are ground up into pellets to feed the livestock. Vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators. The oceans are dying in our time. By 2048, all our fisheries will be dead. The lungs and the arteries of the earth. And you would know that oceans sequester more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. On this basis, no child under the age of five will ever reach retirement age. It is a mathematical, it is an actuarial impossibility. Now, if that does not chill your blood. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a bloody virus. It is a crime of unimaginable proportions. So, meat is the new tobacco. Dairy is the new asbestos. These are not industries. These are atrocities. Squalid, cruel, bacchanalias of butchery. A sordid, ignoble scam. I dare the meat and dairy industry to take me on. Now there are two peak predators on this planet, human beings on land and orcas in the ocean. In the 20th century, human beings killed 200 million members of their own species. Orcas kill none. And don't expect any miracles from your own government either. In the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their own governments. Now, Victor Hugo said there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And that's true. But I would also add, there is nothing more destructive than a bad idea 
whose time has passed. Meet and Dairy's time has passed. <laughs> You see, it is not just about animal rights, it's also about human wrongs. <laughs> animal rights, and you can take it from me and put it in the bank, animal rights is now the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery. This is a revolutionary event more powerful than the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, the Hubble Telescope, or anything ever conceived by Galileo, Copernicus, Einstein, Darwin, or Freud. Because it protects the most precious of all things, life. We, in this room, are on the right side of history. Believe me when I tell you, vegans are creating a new age of enlightenment, the second renaissance. <laughs> Happily for many of us, the world is changing. 20 years ago, Twitter was a bird sound. WWW was a stuck keyboard. Cloud was in the sky. Skype was a typo. 3G was a parking space. Google was a baby's burp. And Al Qaeda was my plumber. Now, the most beautiful word ever written at any time in any country in human history came from India, from the Upanishads, 3,000 years ago. Ahimsa, non-violence to any living being. And I choose to, to define it as non-violence in everything we do, say, and think, not just in what we do. So when I'm asked to describe myself, I describe myself as Ahimsa. And therefore, by definition, I must be vegan. Yes. Not because veganism describes our nationality, our politics, our religion, our diet, or our lifestyle, but because it describes our character. It says we oppose violence wherever and whenever it occurs. Now, all of you in this room would probably know the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, this actually predates the New Testament of Jesus. In fact, it goes back to the Babylonian Jew, Hillel, 70 years BC. And in fact, it goes back even further to the Analects of Confucius, 500 years BC. And the truth be told, it predates the days of writing. It's been inscribed on our hearts forever. Now the great anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a few committed people can change the world. Indeed, that is the only thing that ever has. It's evidence. There are only 13 million Jews in the world. But they play such a vibrant, exciting role in international world affairs. Look at the number of Nobel Prizes that they win every year. Now, Trix and I sat in the stadium during the Olympic Games full of pride as Australia, with a population of only 20 million people, won more medals than every country in the world with the exception of the United States and Russia. Tibet's population is only 3 million. But who hasn't heard of the plight of the Tibetan? But there are over 600 million vegetarians in the world. And that is bigger than the United States, England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all put together. 
If they were one nation, they would be bigger than the 27 nations of the European Union. And despite this massive, massive demographic footprint, they are still drowned out by the raucous, hunt and shoot and kill and cretins who believe that violence is the answer when it should not even be a bloody question. But we live in a world of media sound bites. It reminds me of Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she coins the term the banality of evil. This is how a deceitful mainstream journalist from the biggest newspaper group in the world twisted my innocent words at the Australian Year Awards. Mr. Wallen, I'm surprised a man of your standing would say that Mita's murder. A little old lady with a budgerigar is offending God. Livestock production is unethical. There will be no peace until we stop killing animals. Industry is unattractive. And animals are like human children. Can't you see how offensive that is to our rural audience? Well, this was my diplomatic counterpunch. Well, you certainly bludgeoned the English language to death. But if you're going to quote me, please do it honestly. I did say, a robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. But that came from William Blake in Auguries of Innocence. And by the way, it was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who said, a sparrow does not fall from the sky without Allah knowing. And yes, I did say, the commandment, thou shalt not kill, applies to the murder of any living being. Exactly. It was inscribed on the human heart long before it was proclaimed from Mount Sinai. That was a tall story. And yes, I did say the roots of cruelty are not strong, just widespread. But a time will come when inhumanity, protected by custom, will succumb to humanity championed by thought. A man is ethical only when all life is sacred to him. But actually, that was Albert Schweitzer, winner of the Nobel Prize. And yes, I admit I did say. As long as we kill animals, there will never be peace. It's only a short step to the concentration camps of Hitler and Stalin. There will be no justice as long as a man will stand with a knife and destroy those who are weaker than him. But that was Isaac Singer, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. And yes, okay, I admit I did have something to say about animals and children. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard with the young goat. The young lion with the young ones of the herd, and a little child will lead them. But that came from the prophet Isaiah. I know I didn't say a damn thing about greed and ambition. That wasn't me. That was Jesus. <laughs> Blame him. Behold the birds of the air and the leaves of the field. King Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And for good measure, he threw in a left hook and an uppercut. Whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So are you, as a journalist, suggesting that your rural audience is offended by Nobel Prize winners and prophets? Or should I just go home and burn my books? I seem to recall that was a strategy favored by Paul Pot. Well, the journalist was livid and speechless, and he attacked me for being a radical. Ladies and gentlemen, we need another radical Galileo or Copernicus to remind us that we are not the center of the universe. Animals are not just other species, they are other nations. And we murder them at our own peril. Now, that great historian, Barbara Tuckham, defined folly as acting against our own best interests. That's folly. And Occam's razor, named after the 14th century Jesuit priest, says that when you are presented with many possible solutions to a problem, the simplest solution is always the best. So let's just apply these tests to the animal industrial complex. Forest depletion by the meat industry costs three times as much as the recent global financial crisis. And it happens every year and no one looks. 
Zoonotic diseases from factory farms now threaten the pandemic to rival the Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe. And meat and dairy is killing us and our economies with cancers, heart diseases, and diabetes. Now you would know, Medicare has already bankrupted the once incredibly powerful United States economy. They would need $8 trillion invested in Treasury bills just to pay the interest. And they have precisely zero. They could shut down every school, university, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Homeland Security, FBI, and CIA, and they still will not have enough free cash flow to service their long-term unfunded Medicare liabilities, caused by the disgusting meat and dairy consumption in this once rich and powerful great nation. Now remember, water is the new oil. Nations will soon be going to war over it. Underground aquifers that took millions of years to fill are now running dry. I drilled my first well as a Boy Scout, as a teenager, and we struck sweet water at 80 feet. Today nearby, we're building an orphanage, and at 800 feet, we're sucking mud. And at China, at 3,000 feet, the drill head is still dry. Remember, we have about 500 projects we support in 45 countries. Now you... Now you would be outraged if 10 jumbo jets crashed every day with no survivors. Well, the same number of children die every day through water-related diseases. And many of our greatest rivers, and you know some of them here in California, now, rarely do they reach the sea, sucked dry by the meat and dairy industry. So why do I speak to you about water? Because it takes 50,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of beef, one swimming pool. It takes 1,000 liters of water to make one liter of milk. And a dairyman makes 28 cents a liter for it. What a preposterously stupid idiotic industry. <laughs> These people are financially illiterate. This really is mad at her economics on steroids. One billion people, billion people today are hungry. 20 million people will die this year from malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people and going vegan will end malnutrition forever. And food prices are skyrocketing. It used to cost me Thai rice in Southeast Asia, 197 US dollars a ton for the projects down there. And then it went up to 1,015 dollars a ton. A five-fold increase in five months. And as we travel around, we see poor countries sell their grain to the West for hard currency, whilst their own children starve in their arms. And the West feeds it to livestock. So we can eat a steak? Tell me and tell me the truth. Am I the only one in this room who sees this as a crime? We all do. Believe me, every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a hungry child. When I look into her eyes, do I remain silent? If everyone ate the Western diet, we would need two planet Earths to feed us. We've only got one and she is dying. The Earth can produce enough food for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. And our greenhouse gas pollution from livestock vastly exceeds those of transport. Cars, trains, buses, ships, lorries, bikes, the whole lot. And their methane is 20 times more potent than CO2. The melting Siberian permafrost is now a ticking time bomb. When it releases its sequestered gas, the game is over. The Himalayan ice fields are correctly called the third pole because they feed half the world's population through the Ganges, Indus, Brahmaputra, Yellow Rivers, Yangtze, Irrawaddy, and the Mekong. 
and these glaciers are melting fast. I presented these numbers to 2,000 wealthy Indian entrepreneurs in New Delhi, including Amartya Sen, who had just won India's Nobel Prize in Economics. And I mentioned to Muhammad Yunus, after he won the Nobel Peace Prize, that all the good that he had done with Grameen Bank would vanish when Bangladesh drowns. To say nothing about Manila, Mumbai, Calcutta, Ho Chi Minh City and Bangkok. And then Trix and I had dinner with Al Gore in Australia and we discussed the same numbers. No arguments with me from any of these three Nobel Prize winners. But lots of arguments from the lightweight, ignoble meat and dairy lobby. So Upton Sinclair was right. It is impossible to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And we freak out in Australia when 1,000 refugees arrive on our shores. Just imagine greenhouse gas emissions hitting 500 parts per million or a three degree temperature rise creating 100 million eco-refugees. This calamity will reshape the geopolitical landscape forever. We are facing the perfect storm. If any nation had developed weapons that could wreak such havoc on the planet, we would launch a preemptive military strike and bomb it back into the Bronze Age. But we can't, because it is not a rogue state. It's an industry. The good news is we don't have to bomb it. We can just stop buying it. So George Bush was wrong. The axis of evil does not run through Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. It runs through our dining tables. Weapons of mass destruction are our knives and forks, and increasingly nowadays, our chopsticks. You see, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. This disgusting, ignoble industry will end because we run out of excuses. So I say to you that veganism is the Swiss Army knife of the future. One instrument solves our ethical, economic, environmental, water, and health problems, and ends animal cruelty forever. <laughs> and paradoxically, farmers are the ones who are the most to gain. Farming wouldn't end, it would boom. Only the product line would change. Farmers would make so much money, they wouldn't even bother counting it. And of course, I'd be the first to applaud them. Believe me, the message to send to your leaders is this. Veganism is the engine of redirected economic growth. Governments would love us. New industries would emerge and flourish. Health insurance premiums would plummet. Hospital waiting lists would disappear. Hell, we would be so healthy, we'd have to shoot someone just to start a cemetery. <laughs> I addressed the World Parliament of Religions, and I said that the peace map is drawn on a menu. Peace is not just the absence of war. It is the presence of justice. Justice must be blind to race, color, religion, and to species. If she is not blind, she will be used as a weapon of terror. And today, there is unimaginable terror in those ghastly gulags we call factory farms and slaughterhouses. So talking about peace whilst killing animals is like loving literature and burning books. They are mutually exclusive ideas. They are incompatible in the same way that science is incompatible with a flat earth society. An ethical vegan 
does not need the approval of the meat lobby any more than a Nobel laureate needs the approval of the village idiot. <laughs> so in my journey through Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, I've learned that a man is measured not by how much money he makes, but how much of it he's willing to give away, particularly to strangers. I've learned that if you wish to increase a man's share of happiness, do not aim to increase his possessions, simply decrease his desires. Because I did not find my character on Wall Street, because it lives on the road to Damascus. So Socrates and Epicurus were right. An unexamined life is not worth living, it's not a life, it's actually a life sentence. And my heart resonates to W.H. Orton. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Luther King said, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it polite? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? Now I speak to audiences all around the world, sometimes small groups look like this for 200 people, and sometimes 5,000. And they are all good, decent, caring, loving people who all want to change the world, as long as they don't have to change themselves. <laughs> but life does not work that way. First we change in our hearts, and then the world follows. True leaders must learn to face their own demons courageously. Sitting on the fence is for cowards and crows. <laughs> Martin Niemöller, the German priest, philosopher, and U-boat captain, spent eight years in prison for condemning German intellectuals for being cowards. And he wrote, when the Nazis came for the communists, I remained silent. I was not a communist. When they locked up the Democrats, I remained silent. I was not a Democrat. When they came for the trade unionists, I did not speak out. I was not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I remained silent. I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out. Men and women of integrity must speak out and act courageously. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness of the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. I believe another world is possible, and on a quiet night, I can hear her breathing. It will be difficult, I know, but do not be afraid. Remember Mahatma Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. The last sentence of Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby, reads, So we beat on boats against the tide, drawn back ceaselessly into the past. I ask you, are we to live forever in a sick, smug and cruel past? Let's not relive history, let's make history, because that is what leaders do. They make history. So I welcome you all to the battle in a war that decency cannot afford to lose. Because in the end, only three things matter how deeply you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Meat was not meant for you. 
Our animal cousins have survived millions of years of evolution. They've earned the right to share this planet with us in peace, and they have waited long enough. The brutes and the bullies have been alive, but David is coming. Maybe he's in this room. Maybe he's one of you. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? Thank you all for being here. Another hero who is inspiring us to take action, the compassionate action that we need to take. We need to make the world go vegan. That's the message here. Let's help everyone go vegan. We have a very pleasant duty to introduce the next speaker. Um, one of my projects in Melbourne is called Kindness House. It's a building of 40,000 square feet, and we give it to 300 extremely talented activists from a whole range of disciplines, climate change, animal rights, women's rights, refugees, you name it. Uh, 45 different NGOs like Sea Shepherd, Greenpeace, and a whole bunch of others. It's all free. A, a couple of years ago, I had a phone call from a, a woman who asked if I'd be willing to let her and her husband use our building to promote raw vegan food. And at the time, I had a policy that I would, regardless of the question, my answer would always be the same. I would say yes. <laughs> that couple showed up at Kindness House, and it turned out to be Alan and Jeanette. Well, I went to the first event that they hosted, and it was a big room like this, and it was full of stunningly beautiful fruit, vegetables, flowers, you name it. I was completely blown away. And I was so impressed with how clean and tidy and gentle they were. I didn't say anything, but I was full of admiration for them. Well, two years later, Jeanette very respectfully rang and requested an appointment to see me. And once again, I said, yes. And they just described the plan they had for circumnavigating Australia, the whole continent, by running one marathon a day for 366 days in a row. Now, I don't think I could run a marathon down a well. <laughs> so I showed up at the meeting and they described precisely what they had in mind. Before they had even finished a quarter of their, their pitch to me, I said, stop, I've heard enough. This is what I want to do. I want to put money into it. I want to flag you off when you take off from Melbourne. And I want to welcome you back to Melbourne when you come back. And also, if you don't mind, if you, I'd like to join you for part of the run, as long as you can find a nice downhill bit for me. <laughs> well, the rest is history. They have completed the run, had lots of publicity for raw vegan food, and I understand that now they're fairly significantly advanced to making a film about this adventure and they hope to show it at the Khan Musa uh, Film Festival. And I think they're still looking for funding, so um, please, if you know anyone with deep pockets and, um, and long hands, uh, please let Jeanette and Alan know. Um, and I think I would like to say words that to them and to everyone in this room. Um, Every year, Paul Watson asks me, for the last 10 years, to farewell our ships from Melbourne. 
as we head off to Antarctica to ram the Japanese whalers who are killing whales in the whale sanctuary. And as I say goodbye to all our crews, I repeat words I use often. I leave them, you and Alan and Jeanette with the words that my mother used to read to me when I was a little boy. Christopher Robin is reading to Winnie the Pooh. If ever there is a tomorrow when we are not together, there is something you must always remember. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. But most importantly, even if we are apart, I will always be with you. Thank you all. Welcome to Happy Halloween.